Okay, I'm thinking into consciousness and um, what we mean when we say consciousness. And I'm trying to, I'm phrasing it that way because I think there's a dis there's a distinction to be made there be between the kind of highfalutin ideas that all of us come up with when we try to des describe what consciousness is, and then the details of it. Because when I think of consciousness, I think of things like memories, experiences, perceptions, feelings of pain, emotional states. Um, mystical experiences, if you want to call them that, feelings of transcendence, feelings of my own body, um, mental processes, interpersonal processes that I experience. Um, in other words, whenever I think of consciousness, I always it, it's always got a kind of feature to it. You know, even like in meditation processes, I don't, don't do these days, but I used to meditate quite a lot. Um, there are particular... F it's very different to make waking consciousness, for sure. But there, it, it, it does have features. And those are features which... are, are, are kind of experienced. <laughs> yeah, they're just experienced. Even in some of, the, some of those states don't really have an experiencer as such, you know, in meditation or in states of uh, flow, for example. The, the sense of a self experiencing those is, is diminished or may, may be made absent completely. But there is still some kind of experience. In other words, I can't separate the con from the shusness. I can borrow William James's term here. He, he, he makes that distinction between what he calls shusness and the fact that there's always a with to it, a con, consciousness. Um, so whenever I think about consciousness, and I think when most of us talk about consciousness, it's always something like a consciousness of, or a consciousness with, or a consciousness that has a direction or a vector to it, or intention or something, you know, a sense of agency or bodily state, you know, whatever it is, there's always something there, really. You know, I can't imagine consciousness without that kind of, correlate maybe you can I just can't I suppose to go back to William James again here I'm thinking about how he describes emotions and I'm not putting emotions and consciousness in the, as, as parallels just as, as an, an, an analogy to be drawn here he's talking about an emotion like anger William James and he, and he says you know if you think about what it feels like to be angry you know angry you know you have the tightness in the chest and you have the fists balled maybe in your face is doing something a feeling of, of pressure in the head or you know, whatever it is, you know, how it manifests, maybe a knot in your stomach. Um, he says, imagine all those feelings that you have when you're feeling angry. And then he's, he invites you to just imagine them disappearing one by one. You know, so you've got, you're feeling angry, but just imagine your, that your hand isn't balled into a fist. You're feeling angry, but your face isn't in a grimace. You're feeling angry, but your shoulders are relaxed. You're feeling angry, but your stomach isn't knotted into a tight ball you know you're feeling angry but your breathing isn't laboured and you don't have a feeling of pressure in your head he says if you imagine all those things eventually you get to a point well actually it didn't make any sense to say you feel anger anymore because anger in, in Jamesian terms is the perception the felt perception of that bo of those bodily states and and without the bodily states the bodily accompaniments there simply is no anger you know, we can, there isn't a, a kind of free, floating, nebulous, essential anger emotion, separate from the, um, as I say, the biology of the body, and also, of course, the biochemistry of the brain, which corresponds with those. Um, and I think, in this, to a certain extent, maybe the same is true of this consciousness thing. You know, I certainly find myself talking about it and thinking about it as if it's a kind of free, floating entity, almost like a gas which permeates living things or something. Um, but certainly, as separate from its manifestations, separate from its symptoms. You know, if I think of that, like, here I am conscious, and I think of myself, oh, let's just, just take away vision, and let's just take away the sense of smell or the feeling of coldness on the side of my face from the draft through the door, or just take away the, um, the sound of my own voice, or take away the, the, the internal feeling of the milieu of my body, Take away the memories, let those disappear that I've got. Take away the anticipations of the future. Take away the knowledge that I have, that I can feel mobilising in the construction of these sentences. You know, just take away all those things. Take away my, my, 
the proprioceptive sense of where my arms and my legs and my body is in space. You know, take away all that stuff one by one. You know, am I left with anything conscious at all? I'm not sure if I am. I mean, I may be in some in some abstract sense. I'm, I've, I've been reading quite a bit on in, um, integrated information theory, which is Tononi, uh, 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 physicist, it's not a physicist, uh, neuroscientist's um, kind of attempt to equate consciousness with information, integrated information theory. And there's a good, a good article by Christopher Koch in Scientific, uh, Scientific American Mind right now on consciousness. But when he's talking about it, when Koch is talking about it, Antononi talks about it, they talk about consciousness as being distributed across to all complex systems. So even the simplest thing, even my woolly hat, can has, has a kind of consciousness in it. Um, because it's just a property of complexity or a degree of, of integration within an information system. And since everything has got information in it, there is some degree of information and integration in all systems. Then there's a degree of, of consciousness, they would say. But because our brains have a particular, incredibly complex, the most complex thing in the universe, um, and the degree of information that they integrate is massive, then of course we have this, we have this kind of consciousness. Now that may be true, but just to go back to what I said a minute ago about you know what what it feels like to strip away the contents of one's consciousness, the manifestations of one's consciousness as it presents itself to me at least as a living being. Though it, whilst it may be true that there is a kind of distributed version of consciousness, there is a substrate that's panpsychically extended throughout the universe and all systems which have even the smallest degree of integrated information are conscious. That may be true, but everything that I think of as consciousness, and probably you as well, I'm going to guess. Tell me if you've got a different version of this. Um, are those things that I mentioned, the things that are manifest by the human brain and body in, in, in a context of this kind of environment made available to us by these kinds of sensors. And it is different to being a bat, which, which just has a different set of sensors. And it is different to being a rabbit, which has a different kind of cognitive architecture and it is different to be a whale which has a different set of sensory organs and a different environment we wish to move and all those kind of things so um so i think so whilst it may be the case that consciousness or shusness if i can return to james's term that uh, is is a distributed phenomenon or is not purely an emergent property of the brain everything i suspect that we think of as conscious and valuing consciousness and talk about when we talk to one another about consciousness probably is something like that, a product of the cognitive architectures we have and the relationships they set up with the wider world, whether it's psychically permeated or not. 